We're talking about ecosystem management and this one particular dot point about classifying ecosystems is an important step towards effective ecosystem management. Right, we classify ecosystems using a variety of methods, we understand that by now, and one of the main reasons we classify them is to make informed decisions about how we can manage them, right? So the more data we collect about an ecosystem's features and functions and therefore classify it, the more likely we are to make sustainable decisions when it comes to their use and development. So for example, if we know that a particular region in Queensland is classified as open woodland because we've used specs, then we can measure and count the number of species, their distribution, their population numbers, compare all of these kinds of things to the theoretical or expected numbers for this type of ecosystems. Then if we see a drastic change or a difference over time compared to the expected, we can start to consider these reason, regions endangered or of concern, and we can implement some uh, management strategies to reclaim their natural features, prevent land use and development in, in a negative way. So ecosystem management tries to regulate our use of an ecosystem and the natural resources within it, right? We want to still be able to benefit from them while simultaneously minimizing the impact that we have on them. Uh, so they can still function as, uh, you know, in the level of complexity that they need to um, and make sure that they are self-sustaining. So management strategies must be in place both as a tool for protecting the species and the natural ecosystems, but also, um, you know, anytime something new is being built near them. So some examples of strategies include uh, prescribed burning and management schemes, uh, the control and removal of pest species or exotic species. Uh, we need to monitor their use for recreation and industry like fishing and we need to also, also actively engage in conservation for particular species where need be. So the aim of management is to conserve the composition, structure and function of the ecosystem. So we want to ensure that all the goods and services um, are available on a sustainable basis uh, and the management strategies can be useful uh, as a way to demonstrate that funding is needed to conserve the efforts as well. So if we need government funding and there's a decline in the environment, um, if we're not already doing something to limit that damage, it might not be possible to take the next steps to conserve and rehabilitate. So the aim, um, you know, sorry, the ecosystems uh, offer so many services, uh, you know, and goods essentially, and it might seem a bit silly to say, but, you know, we're talking oxygen creation in photosynthetic organisms, recycling of nutrients, carbon fixation. There might be actual tangible products like natural resources such as timber. And in order to benefit from those functions and services, we as humans need to manage this ecosystem as, you know, their structure, function, composition, so that the ecosystem remains self-sustaining and can keep doing these services. Now, the more data that we collect from an ecosystem, the better informed scientists can be as to what they can do to manage these, um, these ecosystems. So the strategies need to be based on evidence, both in the initial and the ongoing efforts. So that means that strategies are reviewed um, using ongoing data collection to see if the strategy actually works. So for example, if you're doing selective logging rather than say clear cutting all that logging, so we just wanna cut down one or two, not an entire area of land, it's actually possible to measure the biodiversity of the community, you know, before and after and then ongoing to ensure that the strategy you're using is still leaving the ecosystem in a sustainable way. So another example of management strategies uh, include building wildlife corridors. Now these things are quite cool. And what they do is connect wildlife populations separated by human disturbances like roads and logging and development. So populations can continue to participate in immigration and emigration. It also allows for the diversity of the gene pool to increase because of that immigration. And it allows populations resilience in the fact that sorry, it increases their population's resilience in the face of limiting factors like low resources and things like that. So when development actually occurs, this habitat fragmentation occurs, and that means that some animals lose both their habitats or they might also uh, lose the ability to actually be mobile and move to regions where there are resources. Now, the examples that you need to do, uh, that you need to, to look at specifically are old growth forests, old growth forests, coral reefs, and uh, productive soils. So we're gonna look at all of those three. Now, old growth forests are mature forests that have been able to age without any significant disturbance, whether that's human or otherwise. So they contain a diverse range of plant species and they provide a huge number of habitats and micro habitats for other species like animals and fungi and microorganisms. So we're talking uh, logs, you know, fallen tree trunks, leaf litter, layers of the canopy, all those kinds of things. They're considered a really valuable resource for specialised timber from unique species like trees um, in Australia, for example, like a eucalypt. And because of this, they need to be actively managed to ensure that the timber is harvested in a sustainable way so we don't um, you know, lead to negative disturbances. 
Coral reefs are aquatic ecosystems where the growth of coral species dominates the underwater kind of geographical landscape and they're poetically sometimes known as the rainforest of the sea because they contain a huge number of species of coral and they provide habitats and food sources for other aquatic species. Interestingly, they are less than 0.1% of the world's ocean area, yet they provide a home for at least 25% of all marine species, which is massive. So management of these ecosystems is aiming mainly to conserve the biodiversity and just conserve their presence in general because they actually provide some coastal protection. We really need to balance the tourism industry, the fishing industry and all these biotechnology and things like that, which are all industries that benefit from coral reefs resources. Soil is a really thin layer of material covering the Earth's surface and it's formed from the weathering of rocks. It's mainly made up of mineral particles, organic matter, air, water, living organisms, all of which interact slowly but constantly. So plant species derive their nutrients from this soil, we understand that, and all other terrestrial trophic levels then depend on these producers. So soil's ability to maintain nutrients is vital for the survival of all organisms terrestrial organisms. Soil is home to so many decomposer species. We're talking bacteria and fungi, but we've also got nitrogen fixing bacteria, we've got insects, we've got worms, all those things. Productive soils allow for productive farming, right? So without the need for fertilizers, without the need for pesticides. So their management must ensure that the topsoil is not degraded, it's not lost through erosion, and it's not changed in terms of its composition or conditions like its pH, its nutrients, or its salinity. So there's quite a lot in this topic if you want to dig down into it, no pun intended, but it is quite interesting to look at.